Um, thank you so very much, Stephanie, for the introduction. And thanks to Chair of the Walesho Ika Investigative, uh, the Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, dear friend uh, Shopo, good to see you again. And then, um, um, good to see you, um, Laulu. Laulu, I'm always confusing you with marking. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> yes, Laulu. Um, Laulu representing uh, Professor um, Wale Shoinka. And thank you, Mora, Mora, Moturayo. She wouldn't give me <laughs> the opportunity to say I can make it. I, actually, I had to completely change my schedule in order to accept to do this because, I mean, how many times are we going to have Professor Wale Shoinka turning 85? My goodness, please. So nothing, I had to redirect my journey and, and, and be here to do this. And I am very glad that I did so. Um, to the members of the board, as well as very distinguished Nigerians um, that have come out this morning, huh, especially when you're in Lagos, you come out on a Saturday to discuss credible election. Ah, very bad combination. You know, because the Lagos people really want to have a peaceful Saturday. <laughs> and so we're telling them to come and face some serious issues on a Saturday morning. That's a tough one. But um, it is for someone who merits our gathering. And I am so glad that you all came out. So I would just set the tone for the conversation because I really think that what we need is a conversation around this. So I, I started by saying that I am hugely delighted uh, to join Nigerians and all admirers of Professor Akinwande, Oluwale, Shoinka, were all taking advantage of his birthday to call him his full name, which is something you don't do in Africa. You just stay with whatever name that you have been told that person is called. But today we all take great delight in calling him his full name. So we all are excited and wishing him an, a very happy 85th birthday uh, celebration. What an inspiring life of relentless brilliance and activism for a better Nigeria, a better Africa, and a better world. An 85-year-old master satirist who has refused to be indifferent to the evils of power, especially the abuse of it, in a land where life imitates art. Professor Wale Shoinka has so personified the ideals of the irrepressible citizen holding its, his or her nation state to accountability that young Nigerians actually feel entitled to demanding that the professor should continue to lead street protests even at the age of 85. He should protest against good governance while they stay and cheer him on. And many times I have had to say to any of those that came on my timeline to make such <laughs> an assertion, really, you have outsourced your responsibility to an 85-year-old man? Ah, I think you need another think coming. So we are grateful to Professor Wale Shoinka for everything that he embodies. I take particular delight in the fact that I can call him friend. I find the topic of our reflection this morning as quite auspicious, and I am delighted to have this strong cast of co-presenters that will um, en engage in the discussion on rethinking credible elections, accountable democracy, and good governance in Nigeria. The theme of this lecture comes just a few months after our 2019 elections, marking 20 years of uninterrupted democratic process in our country, called the, now the Fourth Republic. It is 20 years of the Fourth Republic. 
Um, it is an event of, it is events of this kind by the prestigious center uh, for investigative journalism that, that really help us to nourish the necessary counter narratives that are necessary to the usual anti-intellectual and extremely vexing victory song of winner, oh winner, that our democracy has been reduced to. Our democracy has unfortunately been reduced to a booty venture. And that merits a rethink. A rethink, what does that actually mean? To rethink something is to reassess it, is to review or to reconsider something, a matter, an issue, a course of action or process, an idea, a position or condition, especially in order to change it. Rethinking, therefore, does not merely involve uh, uh, ruminating on an issue and then walking away. You know, it involves taking practical measures of effecting the changes that are necessary in order for what you rethought to give you the desirable and improved outcome from the past. So rethink presupposes, of course, that in the initial phase, we thought at all. Because if you have not thought at all, what are you going to rethink? But I want to stay within the context of our conversation and to imagine that rethinking credible, democracy, credible elections is a way of saying, rethinking our democratic practices so far, at least say for the fourth republic, and imagining how better it could be. The context in which we have been asked to do a rethink today um, is credible elections, democratic accountability, and good governance in our country, Nigeria. And as you see, all of these are interlinked, interconnected. I suppose that 20 years of uninterrupted conduct of elections has provided sufficient ground for us to do some sort of stock take of our democratic practices in order to have empirical and analytical anchors on the basis of which we can begin to imagine that our elections, our democratic accountability, and our good governance should cease being mirage. Accountability and good governance are often the basis upon which elections go from mere events to becoming a journey toward an ultimate good end. Because after all, elections, properly so-called, are the cornerstone of democratic governance and political stability. Through elections, governments obtain their democratic mandate and then are held accountable for their performance while in office. Elections are the means by which a modern de representative democracy um, is, is, found, is, is founded and it is the process by which citizens are given the opportunity to make the formal decision formal decision as to who they choose from among those who seek to gain legitimacy to lead in public office from the rest of the crowd that are available. Elections are not an end in themselves, but merely means to an end. Election, although a process, is an activity or an event within an extremely short time span which is why we cannot rest on the oars of a, an election conducted. <laughs> That's not the end that we seek. However, the outcome that an election produces is the end, um, and ideally uh, should, be, uh, should be democratic government, uh, governance that 
citizens installed through the exercise of their vote. So, in effect, the outcome, when an outcome follows after an election, for that particular specific election, that's the end for the election. But for democracy, no, it is not. The process of democracy is much more than an election. Ladies and gentlemen, our topic talks about credible elections. For an election to be adjudged as meeting the standards that confer legitimacy on its outcome, there has over the years grown a body of features and characteristics that are associated with credible elections. As a matter of fact, there is a shift in terms. In the past, it was always said free and fair election. And then over time, as people saw that there, there, was, there was a lot of methodological issues involved in determining free and fair, it, the language began to evolve. And I think that our friend from uh, the INEC will, uh, will bear witness to this. The language began to evolve over time. And the conversation became about credible elections. But one thing that is necessary if, is for us to remember that the quintessential feature of democracy is what is reflected in the Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations in 1948, where it stated that everyone has the right to participate, to take part in the government of his or her country uh, directly or through freely chosen representatives, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage, and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. Ladies and gentlemen, if this definition by the, under the United Nations Declaration is anything to go by, it has been built upon by regional declarations, the Africa Union. Um, it's been built on by sub-regional declarations, the ECOWAS protocol, and Nigeria is a signatory to both the universal, the global one at the UN level, the AU1 charter, the AU charter, as well as the ECOWAS protocol. Therefore, we are bound to what we have committed to, even though not everything that we have committed to has found its way into our own national legal framework governing the conduct of elections. In terms of understanding what it is that, the, what, what, what are the clear features that we see in genuine credible elections? One standard definition does not exist because it is quite variable in terms of people's definition. But one thing that is very clear is that from the perspective of the fissures, there is an organizing framework that looks at the fissures of credible election as including inclusivity, transparency, accountability, and competitiveness. Inclusivity, transparency, accountability, and competitiveness. And these features are germane to an election being considered as credible. Even a more important feature is the fact that out of the accountability feature is a very strong importance that is attached to the integrity of the election management body, in our own case, the INEC, Independent Electoral um, Commission. 
What this supposes for us on a day that we discuss this topic is to use the closest proximate of an assessment of an election that immediately held to determine where we are in terms of the credibility of our election. And I dare to quote from what observers of the election in 2019 had to say. And I choose not even to quote the EU, European Union, election observers, nor do I want to quote the, um, the um, NDI, National Democratic Institute, and uh, the International Republican Institute observe, observer mission, I would prefer to quote a coalition of civil society that represent our collective agitation for improvement in our democratic culture. The Situation Room is a coalition of, I think, more than 70 civil society groups. And the Situation Room has invested itself over the years since about 2010 in building a body of knowledge around what should be the minimum baseline for credible, legitimate elections in our country. And they use this baseline to drive advocacy for the programming and assessment of elections in our country. And this is what they said about the 2019 election. Just a short quote. Nigerians 2019 general elections were marked by severe operational and transparency shortcomings. So we knock off transparency, right? Are you guys awake? Okay, <laughs> I'm just checking, you know, because you remember the four features that we talked about, right? It was, it was what? In inclusivity, transparency, competitiveness, and accountability. So the, this body that represents our collective agitation for those who are not you know, quite involved as civil society, but knowing that organizations like that uh, exist, or, or like, like that exist, uh, are very, exist, are very happy to at least outsource that responsibility to them. They said that the election was marked by severe operational and transparency shortcomings. It had electoral security problems, which therefore would have meant that inclusivity would have been compromised in one form or the other. Then he talked about um, low turnout, and he talked about the problems of competition, and then talked about the challenges of accountability. So if by the standard of what the Situation Room had to say about the 2019 election, what it recommended was that there should be an independent investigation and review of that election in order to enable us to know what went wrong and how to fix them, in order to raise the standard of those features of credible elections that have become global norm. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that stood out in the 2019 election is of course the level of voter apathy. That significantly, seriously compromised what that feature of democracy about participation, inclusivity, the fact that that power of the citizen to exercise that vote is the greatest power of citizenship. If only 37% of those who could have done it did that, 
then we are not yet at the level of credibility that our elections must have. Now, with issues of credibility of the election, I think that the key next point is the democratic accountability. What is democratic accountability? Democratic accountability refers to the many ways in which citizens, political parties, parliaments, and other democratic actors can provide feedback to reward or sanction officials in charge of setting and enacting public policy. So the democratic accountability is what happens in the horizontal relationship between the public officials and citizens as well as private sector. Democratic accountability can also be vertical. Sorry, I think I'm mixing it up. The horizontal is what happens between the interstates. So basically the checks and balances that happen between all the actors, the formal political actors within a democracy. While the horizontal accountability is what happens between the government, the formal institutions of government, and their citizens as well as the private sector. And so this combination of horizontal and, and, and vertical accountability is very crucial in order to determine the quality of responsiveness that emanates from governance. This democratic accountability does not stop with when government is formed. It is actually a, a process that includes all formal structures and institutions of democracy. And so the election body has a responsibility for democratic accountability. The political parties have responsibility for democratic accountability. When government is formed, the political leaders that have formed government, as well as the bureaucracy that support the delivery of services to the citizens, have responsibility for democratic accountability. What has happened is that we have seen steady supply of what formal institutions regard as accountability. So you have INEC, you have the political parties, some 93 of them, or is it 91? Depends on which one. Is it 91? 93. I was 92, okay, I removed one. Okay, you know, so 92 of them, they have that responsibility. But the issue is that those political parties and INEC have their democratic accountability responsibility, both do they play those roles. Now when it comes to the matter of the supply of institutions for democratic accountability, we have a national assembly, we have a judiciary, we have an executive, they are institutions that should offer democratic accountability. So on the supply side of democratic accountability, we have the systems that ought to supply them. But do we have democratic accountability? I, I need an answer. Do you think we have democratic accountability? Analytically, we don't. Because if we did, we will not come out in the region and neighborhood of poor governance that we come out in all measures of governance and accountability, whether it is 
by the organization that I am part of, Transparency International, where our score is still less than four out of a possible 10, or it is the doing business in you know, a, a, a ranking where we still are in the lowest percentile of countries, or it is the World Economic Forum competitiveness, uh, global competitiveness uh, ranking, where we still are at the lowest quarter, quartile of countries. So we do have an analytical basis for saying that this supply side of democratic accountability is not yet working as it should. And therefore, rethinking is very crucial. And that's what we're gathered to do today. Then, when you think of the supply side, it means that there must be a demand side. The demand side for democratic accountability is what constitutes the citizens and their pressure for improvement in governance outcomes. It is the pressure that citizens and social movements exert on the political process on the democratic institutions that enables an interaction between supply side and demand side of democratic accountability process. When that is missing, you are unlikely to have any significant measure of accountability within your democratic system. So we go from this poor score of our democratic accountability to the next concept or construct in our topic. And it's the construct on good governance. Good governance is, of course, the expectation that, is, that the government and its mechanisms work effectively to deliver the desired outcome to citizens. Good governance constitutes all the processes and the procedures and the structures and the institutions and the vision that leads to the delivery of governance outcomes to citizens. And when you look at a broad definition of it, we say that a government whether of the developing or the developed advanced economies of this world, will be considered as providing good governance to the extent there are that certain features are, are, can be attached to the process through which governance is delivered. And so in that definition, we have things like participation, equality, equity, we have accountability, we have the rule of law, we have um, the, uh, the, the features like responsiveness and transparency, so that our topic is so interconnected. It is impossible to have good governance without democratic accountability. It is impossible to have democratic accountability without credible elections. So, to the extent that we drop the ball on any of them, to that extent, do we not have any of them? Ladies and gentlemen, so that it would not be that we're simply saying eh, there is no good governance because we don't like the government, which is the today's conversation in a democracy. Nobody cares who you like in a democracy. The culture of democracy is that we, as citizens, must have the voice. That's why voice is an important part of accountability, an important part of good governance. We must have the voice to speak to what our demands are on government so formed. So what are the features, what are the things that show us clearly that we are struggling with good governance. I think when Mr. Roper spoke, he already 
made a key and important point amongst all of them. It is that number one, the, 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 the absolute belief is that good governance is demonstrated in the security and safety of life of citizens. Citizens have to be alive in order to enjoy the benefits of governance. So that is number one. Number one of all the things about good governance is that a government is effective enough to safeguard the lives of citizens. Now, would we say that that is our story? That is not our story because aside from the real life situation that he pointed out that happened only yesterday or maybe two days ago, we do know that analytical um, information, data that was picked up over a period of time, said that in, in 2018, we may have actually lost about 3,000 of our fellow citizens in needless killings in our country without any consequence to those that killed them. The second point is that a, a, any country that is assessed in, in, with regard to good governance in terms of output and outcomes would be a country that assures through sound policies this, this almost, almost um, I'm, I'm looking for the right word, um, a given, a given level of standard, of improvement in standard of living, in other words, quality of life. The quality of life of the citizens. And in measuring quality of life, we normally would look at the economy, and we would look at human development, and we would look at physical infrastructure, and then we would look at the social capital within that society. On all scores, our country does badly. In terms of the economy, latest United Nations um, work looking at absolutes in poverty says that our number has inched to 98 million Nigerian citizens. But you see, even that measure is on the basis that you're looking at poverty, extreme poverty. If you took away extreme from poverty, the number jumps beyond count. So if we held to that 61%, that the National Bureau of Statistics had during its last household survey, I think it is currently uh, doing a new household survey to get a most recent poverty number. The 2011 household survey had something of, the, of about 61% as the number on poverty. But when you talk about extreme poverty, if you don't like the number that was recently given by the United Nations studies, you can look at the number that the World Poverty Map released, where it shows that our country has overtaken a country that is six times our population, India, in the number of extremely poor people at more than 83 million. Now, that is so statistically significant because it's as close enough to half our population as you can imagine. Such huge colony of poor people represent a destabilization threat for democracy. So that rethinking our democracy is absolutely important, and I thank the organizers for laying this on. When you think in terms of economic growth, which is the driver of reduction in poverty, you find that our good governance is still a dream. The reason being that in the last almost five years, you know, I think it's four years since um, 
that maybe two, 2014 was when our growth sharply dropped. So what we have done is that we have been at the lowest region of economic growth in recent times. At a growth in the economy of less than 3%, while population growth is about 3%, we are not growing at all. We are dropping more citizens into poverty. That is not correct thing to do in order to build a lasting system of credible democracy. Because ultimately, when the quality of life is not improved amongst the generality of your citizens, they will tend to ask you someday, democracy for who? And they would ask you, democracy for what? So it is important that we should see that democracy as an exercise in of itself is good, which is why I celebrate the fact that we have 20 years uninterrupted democracy. But if we stopped at that, then we do a damage to the psyche of the Nigerian citizen whose power to vote is the basis of democracy. Another indicator that is scary is the indicator on human capital development. Our education system, our health system, access to water and sanitation, issues of, on resilience and environment come together to determine your human development. In all measures of human development, our country comes out mediocre. We have not even attained a possible five out of, we have not attained a five out of a possible 10. In most measures, whether it be by the UNDP or it be by the World Bank, we are coming at the region of four out of 10. That is problematic. That is evidence of not good governance. And then another thing that we measure, the quality of infrastructure in a country. Infrastructure in the widest definition of it. In all the indicators that we have seen, we come in the lower regions of, of global comparisons. That is another evidence of a problem that we have with good governance. If we thought of all of these and said, but when we had military rule, was the situation any better? Well, it would be an intellectual question to probe. If people say, when we had military rule, it was not any better. Therefore, don't put too much pressure on democracy. It would be legitimate for citizens to ask, why then did we feel compelled to see a person like the professor that we celebrate today fight with all his life for democracy. The reason that democracy is worth fighting for is that we have found from studies that there is a very strong correlation between democracy, economic growth, economic development, and therefore improvement in the quality of life of citizens. <laughs> and this problem of a complete lack of dignity for the human life that we have seen was something that related more to military rule than to democratic practice. Which brings me toward the end. Because the end of my conversation in a few minutes is that to the extent 
that the sanctity of the Nigerian life is now under threat, significant threat, because of the failure of the governance system to uphold that sanctity means that we must all rise to demand a complete rethink of the kind of democratic processes that lead to poor governance. If our democratic processes over a period of 20 years has only but delivered a, denig a, a denigration and a devaluation of the Nigerian life, then it must be scrutinized, it must be interrogated, and it calls necessarily for a broad conversation. The reason is that we must save our democracy from blemish. Our current democracy is blemished because of its inability to deliver the desirable outcome for citizens. If citizens do not feel the sense of improvement, that must be corrected. And I, dare, I therefore say that there are some three issues that I believe are necessary for us to focus on. Number one issue is that whereas the citizens have understood how important, how important their role is in a democracy, they haven't completely understood and appreciated this enough to play that role. It, the office of the citizen is the most important office in a democracy. No greater person than Roos President Theodore Roosevelt had stated that government is not an amalgam of alien forces. Government is actually the citizens. And I therefore de have declared often that office of the citizens is the office that gives legitimacy to all other political offices in the land. And so the office of the citizen is the highest office in the land. The office of the president is the highest political office subordinated to the office of the citizen. And until the citizens understand this, then our democracy will be government of the politicians, by the politicians, for the politicians. That is wrong. Because the true definition of democracy is that it is government of, by the people, of the people, and for the people. So that's number one. We need to reposition the citizen at the center of our democratic process, starting with elections. Number two point is that the citizens have inadvertently abandoned politics to politicians. And therefore, the most important vehicle of politics, which is political parties, has been turned into a, sim a mere political, it's a, I, I call it a, a, a political entrepreneurship vehicle. A vehicle for political entrepreneurship because of the abdication of citizens for politics. And so a few club members register a political party and then use the political party as the basis for democracy. It cannot work. As they normally say, could they work? <laughs> it won't. Because what, you, what we have today in our country, as large as they are, 92 of them, are mere vehicles of political transactions. Political parties, properly so-called, are supposed to be the vehicles that embody the spirit 
the content, the message, the vision, the nuances, the ethos, the principles, and the vision of governance. Every political party is supposed to be regarded as a government in waiting. What ideology do we have in the realm of political party development in our society? Next to zero. And then the third point is the quality of political actors. To the extent that the that the elite of our society have not heard, and I included, until I decided that I wanted to stop being foolish, to expect great outcome from people that I know would not offer great outcome in, in, in governance. Plato said it, that if you think that politics is beneath you, you will be governed. In fact, he said, you will be ruled by your inferiors. When we look at the quality of our political actors, the elite of this society have a lot of introspection, a lot of rethinking to do. I don't understand how the Lagos crowd of brilliant people doing great things in business will assume that they will get sound policies out of government when governance true politics is left in the hands of their inferior. And then they go around befriending people and calling them excellency that they know is not excellent. They call distinguished that they know is actually extinguished. And then they call honorable to one who is most dishonorable. And we have this distortion in our political system, and we expect great governance outcomes. It's impossible. It's impossible. So it is a good thing that we're gathered to rethink the architecture of our politics. Because until the citizens now realize that there would be no possibility of improvement in their economic well-being, and that there will be no improvement in their safety and security without good governance. And that good governance will not be possible without democratic accountability. And that you will not get democratic accountability if you do not have credible elections leading to the election of people who understand all of these concepts. Then <laughs> it's going to be a long time waiting. But I don't want us to put too much more work on Professor Wale Shoinka. He has done enough for this society. He has risked it all as often as possible for the sake of the country. Professor Wale Shoinka ought to have become an emblem for the rest of us to become unique citizens who will not sit by and by while abuse of political power continues in our land. I want to end on this note. Recently, a vexing issue of Ruga took the country by storm. And you could see the level of tardiness with which a government thought of a matter so polarizing. If the president didn't learn anything from Ruga, then we should let him know that Ruga pointed to him that he is president of a highly divided country. I've never seen this country this divided. This divided, trenchant division very strong division in the country. What does it say to us? That the real rethink of everything we're discussing here today, credible elections, many people do not believe that the 2019 election rose to the standard where they could accept the outcome. 
in terms of the, the necessary rebuilding of this society for the social capital necessary for governance. President Buhari must know that it is now time to invite all parts of this country to a conversation that is deep introspection, retrospection, and radical rethink of how our democracy is constituted for the future. The future is what I imagine when we shall come to 100 years of the celebration of Professor Shoinka's life. Because by then, if we have done our rethinking well, with a president who can at least gain something for his legacy, seeing that there is none yet, he needs to gather this country and let's have a conversation that would be the basis of us building a nation that a hundred year old Professor Wole Shinka can be proud of. And if by that time he says goodbye to us, we would say goodbye, great patriot. Thank you very much. <laughs>